Rock, just to start off, um, before you, do um, you want to put the glass down? Do you want me to put the glass I'd down? I'd like you to put the glass down. Put the glass down. Okay, that's very good. Thank you. Well done. Uh, before you guys work together, um, and I, I'm going to ask you about when you first met and how it came about, but were you familiar with George Stevens' films? Well, absolutely. Um, I had seen uh, most of the films uh, without being aware the, of which uh, director directed the films. In other words, as, as a kid back in Chicago, uh, who cares who directed it and who was the sound man and who was the cameraman, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, as long as it starred so and so and so and so. I mean, that's all I cared about. Oh, yes, it's Cary Grant or it's Catherine Hepburn or it's what have you. So, although I had heard his name, I had heard of David Sosnick. I didn't, as a young teenager, as a uh, middle age, middle 15, 16 year old, I didn't pay too much attention to those people, except that I was aware of their names. Uh, after I became an actor, then of course, I of course did know of George's names as everybody else's name, and, and cameramen and sound men too, but uh, um, I saw most of the films, uh, being a big movie fan mm -hmm. as a kid. And when the, what, when the opportunity came for you to work with him, what was your... No, oh, well, scrape me off the ceiling. I mean, it's thrill, the thrill of a lifetime for me. Um, because he had made so many excellent, perfect films, I think that to work with him, get a chance to work with him, um, was really something for me. Plus the role itself was a pretty good role to have. And, uh, and also, I, um, and I don't remember whether this was before I had met him or after, I can't sort that out in my mind because it was only last week, you see. But, uh, I asked a lot of people who had worked with him, what's it like to work with him? And they all, to one, said, just make yourself a piece of putty and put yourself in his hands, and he'll do it all. And um, I thought to myself, oh, well, yeah, but I mean, come on, an actor prepared, he must got to, you know, know what he's going to do, and he's going to so forth and so on. And uh, so I, of course, was prepared. I don't mean by prepared, not only low, knowing lines, but get an idea, a general idea of what I wanted to do. And uh, it was all so easy with him and so effortless. Uh, the script was so well written that I didn't really have to sit down and learn lines. For example, I, I just uh, ingested them and they just came out and the scenes just sort of flowed out. Uh, we had lunch someplace and George had a way of looking at you and looking right through you. And you'd better tell the truth. That's it. He'd look. Well, of course, I got um, <clears throat> trying to be casual about all this and failing constantly. And I was uh, practically saluting, uh, you know, Mr. Stevens is very <clears throat> nice to, to meet you. And of course, after an hour or so and a drink or two, I hope, I was calling him George. Well, now, George, what do you think about this? And he'd look at me. And I knew just by calling him George, I had made a mistake. Except I didn't. Except I did. <laughs> just, he kept me always on off balance. Never trying. But he, he had to control as a director. Control is not a good word, yet it is control. 
and make me think it's my idea. He would go to great pains to go all the way around, over this way and that way, to make me think it's my idea, so that I would come up to him and say, George, I have a good idea for this scene. He'd say, what's that, Rock? And I'd tell him and say, yes, that's a good idea. And it was his all along. And he caught me every time. Every time. But it was really true that, that what everybody said, put, make yourself a piece of putty and put yourself in his hands and rely on him. And that was partly, I think, how a way of his to make the great films that he, and get the marvelous performances that he got out of people because they just simply let it out. Tell me, start by tell me how old you were when you did Giant and a little bit about the thing of a young man playing a part that had to go. Well, I was, let's see, 1955, I was uh, 29, I think. 29, yeah. And I had to be in the movie, I had to be a young, in the young 20s, 23, 24, 25. And then middle age, I guess 45 to 50. And then older age, I guess 65 to 70, about. Um, incidentally, I don't know if I had told you this, a couple of years ago, I was in Chicago, and Giant was on being run on television late at night, and I just come back from the theater. And I don't like to watch uh, films on television, particularly those that I am involved with. But I was curious. And so I knew when I would be the 45 to 50 year old age, about what time I tuned it in to look. And I looked at myself and ran to the mirror and looked in the mirror and it was exactly the same, including where the gray is, where most of the gray is. To a T, it was exactly. So now I know what I'm going to look like when I'm 70. <laughs> yeah, I thought of that when you walked in. Really? Really? Except you don't have the padding around the no, face. No, <laughs> well, uh, no. Well, <laughs> no. Some. <laughs> oh, did he, was, did George have, have humor? <clears throat> he loved, yes, he had great, deep humor. Um, as I remember, he never liked uh, jokes, particularly. He loved to play gags on people. He was a devil. Um, I never saw him uh, break up laughing. He would be amused, he would smile a lot. But his humor was for example, this might take a little while to tell. I hope I can tell it fast. Uh, I copied uh, his walk when I was playing the old part, which was a kind of a portly walk. We never discussed it. And there was a scene where I had to walk from one room into the bedroom, around a bed, sit down and get on the phone, angry, mad. So I had to walk fast. Well, I didn't know how to do that fast, so I thought I'd be clever. I said, George, uh, would you do me a favor? Uh, would you walk around this bed and sit down? I want to see something. He said, sure, Rob. And the first time he came in, he came in like so, on tippy-toe, tit 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 and around the bed. Well, he started me laughing. Now, I have on a rubber face with appliances and, you know, the whole thing. I said, no, come on, I really, oh, he said, I'm, I'm very sorry. And the next time he came in and did a pole vault right over the bed and landed in the spot and got on the phone. He says, is that what you want, Ron? Well, of course, I was laughing so hard now that all the makeup had cracked and broken off, and it's now three in the afternoon, and the makeup man became irate because it was a long makeup, three-hour makeup in the morning. And he read in the riot act. And George said, you're absolutely right, uh, Frank, Frank. I'm very sorry. That's a wrap. 
And we went all through the afternoon because it would have taken three hours to start all over again. But I mean, when he, when he would do things like that, he was funny. He was a funny, funny man, but it was all very deep humor. As I say, he never liked any, he was never, he was not a surface man at all. I asked him one time, you know, and every time I asked him a question, it always came out stupid. I said, uh, we were flying to, te to Texas together. And I said, uh, do you read much, George? Making conversation. And he gave me that look. And he said, uh, yes, Rob, I read everything. Mm -hmm. Oh, I see. Well, back out the window I went. <laughs> 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 Okay. 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 Coming up. Okay. Sounds strange to hear his voice. Yeah. Um, what? Just maybe just to ask that. I mean, just hearing him talk. What? If you had to characterize him, what kind of a man was he? Solid marble. A heavyweight. Thorough. Exhaust every avenue. Was giant hard work? No. No. Uh, uh, I don't want to say it was easy, and yet it was easy. He made it easy. How about on him? Was was. Do you recall whether it was tough on him or whether... It was tough on him. He would never let anybody know it. But... Oh, okay, I'll tell you. I, I loved him. I followed him around like a puppy. I would uh, worship that man. And so I saw perhaps a little more than maybe other people did <clears throat> on the set or in the cast, but he uh, had a couple of ulcer attacks, and I guess there were some buttes. Tried never to let anybody know. He perspired a lot. Kept himself all bundled up in the heat of West Texas in the summer. I never understood that. When um, Jimmy Dean died, we got word. We were all in the um, projection room watching dailies. <clears throat> Somebody came blubbering in and said, Jimmy just got killed. And George left. And uh, I followed him. And we walked down through the sound stages, through. Warner Brothers lot. And I lost him. I couldn't find him. I don't know where he went. Why? Where he was going. Except to guess that he just wanted to be by himself for a while. Or for how long he was there, I don't know. I gave up, left, went back. Everybody had left the projection room, gone home. I went home. next day he was not a particularly kind man uh, he and Elizabeth had a few words together she was upset and he was being I thought at the time cruel he wasn't he was trying to get her to stop thinking about it. Therefore, he was trying to crack the whip. To go and don't indulge yourself and don't think about it and go for it. And, and it didn't work. <laughs> Not with Elizabeth. <laughs> well, he had a couple of... I remember he was like a father to you. Or, I mean, you guys were really pals. Yeah. But Jimmy was a little... 
was not that easy, was it? With well, George I don't Bates. think so. Of course, George, in his dealing with uh, everybody in the cast uh, and in his direction, never was a... Uh, he was very private about it. He would take Jimmy aside to go for long walks to discuss a scene, or he would take me over and to discuss something and talk about the general, my general frame of mind. Because he made sure that my mind was, was Beck, Benedict. And as long as he was sure that my mind was there, was right, um, he let me go. That's why I'll never understand that one line that he gave me. Because he never gave me much a direction in terms of, you know, when you pick up the glass, put it over there before you say the word go or whatever um, the direction was. But it was early on in shooting, and we were shooting a barbecue sequence out in West Texas. And the scene was where I was introducing my new wife, Elizabeth Taylor, to my friends, the Texas ranchers. And I was going on about blah, 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 and this is so and so and so and so. And he came up and he looked at me. He said, Rock, we've got a long way to go. Just an awful long way to go. And walked away. And I still had no idea what he meant. I see. I don't know if you met in shooting schedule or in... <coughs> I don't know. And I was too embarrassed to say, I don't know what you're talking about, George. What do you mean? <laughs> Tough in that it, we shot it for a week. Mm -hmm. A fight. I mean, I used to come home at night with my arms like this, thinking they're going to fall off any minute, you know. Why do you think you shot so many? <laughs> well, George, uh, as you know, shot an awful lot of film. An awful lot of angles. Um, I think that, uh, I mean, several people have said he shot so much film from so many angles because he didn't know what he wanted. I never thought that. I always thought that if he's going to be a sculptor, he'd better have enough clay with which to make the bust. What was his office like? I mean, you talked to, you talked to Susan about you go that thing of creating an atmosphere of Texas. You felt the stuff up on the wall. And All the build bulletin boards, yes. Mm -hmm. It was full of Texas. Full of Texas, all of it. And pictures of rodeos and photographs of Texans from different styles of clothes and uh, anything you can mention that had to do with the Southwest, really. Not just a uh, Texas, but uh, the arid Southwest was all over, every, bulletin boards all over the office, split in half, going up one side and down the other, just to get this wonderful feeling of what he was trying to put on film. Did, did, you, did he, did you ask you, did he, did he, when you were going to have to fight as an old man, did, was there some business where you asked him how to, how do you fight as an old man? Yes. Uh, I did say, you know, how, how does an old man fight? I've never seen an old man fight. He doesn't last, couldn't last very long, especially with a younger man, especially with a younger man as big as that man was. If I remember right, he was about 6'6 six, six or 6'7. Six, big guy. Well, we... Uh, cheated a bit and made it a nice, long, good movie fight. But uh, I said, what about uh, movement? What about um, throwing a punch and all of that? And he, I, I, if I remember right, I think he said, well, throwing a punch, I don't think an old man is any different than a young man. An old man will think the punch out a little bit more, a little bit more deliberate. A young man might be a little faster. But if it connects, it's going to be the same. 
but it did give me for all of the old age a uh, skin diver's weighted belt, 50 pounds, I think it weighed, so that uh, I had trouble in movement, uh, <clears throat> in particular, like getting out of a chair. I had to really work to get out of the chair and or sitting down to fall in like, a, like an elderly person does, so I didn't have to play that. It was there which was, that was a good thing. Then I had this union suit on full of cotton, which was nice and cool, I remember. Mm -hmm. Oh, boy, was that hot. Can I ask us to cut for just a second? Can we get a second? No, marker for 63. No. Mm. Second stick, sorry. Two sticks. <coughs> remember? I remember the, uh, when that, the shot came on the screen. The whole audience went, oh, and just were heartbroken yeah. when Angel Obergon comes back. And of course, it was a pivot in the film, wasn't it? Because uh, that led your character, who'd been resisting the. Uh, yeah. What did you do? Remember? Bigot, big. Yeah. Well, I, I went to, I went to uh, both uh, Elizabeth and I, Leslie and I went to the funeral. But you went and got the flag out, remember? I went and got the flag, the, the uh, Lone Star flag of Texas. Yeah. Gave it to his grandfather, old Polo. Yeah. yeah. I remember, were you there that day? Don't remember. <clears throat> I remember uh, they, we shot in a, a little village, I believe called Valentine, Texas. Mm -hmm. And uh, several uh, people were used as atmosphere or extras or what have you, local people, all elderly people. And uh, we went through the service of the funeral and they all sobbed. I remember that very well, and I, I don't know, you know, why they were sobbing, probably reminded them of perhaps a, a child or a grandchild, or perhaps a similar situation. But they all, all sobbed, all of them. Well, you were young when you made that. Did, did you have any sense, that you think, of what he, what George stood for, or was that not? No. No, no I didn't. Uh, I only felt that it was, I only felt that it was dramatically correct mm -hmm. and a hell of a moment in the scene and a hell of a third act ending, a second act ending. Do you remember asking him, and if you remember this, if you'd start with the word comedies, about asking him, I mean, work the word comedies and the beginning of your answer, did you ask him once why he didn't? Yes. I said, George, you have made so many brilliant brilliant comedies, romantic comedies, what have you, action comedies. Why don't you do some more? And he gave me that look. Well, Rock, they're just too much trouble. And walked away. I never, he didn't permit me to say, what do you mean by that? Nothing. Gone. That was the end of that discussion. You talked a little bit about um, his knowing the material, his and, 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 and perhaps another point, um, the sense of the real on the set, that, that and then the picture, that things had to be real, props, clothes, flowers, costumes. Yes. Could you talk about that a little bit? Mm. No, I can't, actually. Uh, 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 yes, every, all the flowers in the wedding scenes, Thousands of flowers were all, there was a whole florist shop over here on the side of the soundstage. I remember we'd get fresh flowers in for when they started to wilt or uh, get to uh, get bring in fresh flowers. Let me ask you another question. The wedding scene, when you come back to yes. Virginia, how, do you know how that emotion, I mean, that was a, I remember to me when I saw the picture, I remember reading the script. It was so unexpected when I sensed that thing of you coming in behind 
Well, two things about that scene. First of all, there was a, a, a long shot. The scene was uh, Elizabeth's younger sister gets married to Rod Taylor. And Elizabeth is the maid of honor. And we had just had a fight in Texas. And she went back with the kids. And then I'm too lonely, so I come back to get my wife and kids. And that's the situation when I walk in the door. It's a wedding. And so everybody gets caught in, caught up in the, in the wedding and the wedding march, et cetera, which is very easily getting to get caught up in, at, for, with, what, why. Um, but I remember um, I had to be in the back of the crowd and to watch what was happening and then see, go into another room, the dining room, so I could sneak around in the corner and watch the wedding from the dining room, which is hidden and so forth and so on. And George said, you're not tall enough. Can you walk on your tiptoes? And I said, yes. So I walked on my tiptoes and I wasn't tall enough. Ended up, they built a ramp about eight feet high behind all these people, about a 30 foot walk on this ramp. I mean, I'm six feet four and I'm not tall enough. And I had to walk on this ramp behind these people through. But the other thing is, if you want me to tell you about Elizabeth, myself we didn't know each other um, then that was the very beginning of shooting because we had this one house for set for two scenes sequences before we went on location so it was at the very beginning very beginning of the film and the night before elizabeth very nicely had asked my my then uh, my future wife and i to come over to her, she and Michael Wilding's house for dinner. Have an evening of getting acquainted, and it's going to be a long time together, and so forth. So it was very nice and very polite of her to do so. And we did. And we had a wonderful time. And it was a very liquid evening. And several martinis later, suddenly realize it's three in the morning. And we have to get up and go to work and shoot this wedding scene. Well, Elizabeth had to get up, I guess, at 5, 5.30. Girls don't have it as lucky as guys do. I had to get up around 6.30 or something. <coughs> but we both were so dreadfully hungover. And we had to shoot this scene, this highly emotional scene, of, and not a word to each other, but just look at each other, just moony-faced. And we shot the scene and the sequence and the hairdressers and the wardrobe girls and everybody were over there crying and carrying on. The truth is we were just so hungover that we couldn't do anything but just look. And, and that was it. And they thought, oh, that's beautiful acting. Beautiful acting. Dreadful. A dark day in my life. Just a couple to wrap things up. Um, did you ever see... Uh, People have observed that for all of these qualities that were appealing, did you ever see uh, George very hard? I mean, could he? Let me just could he be hard? And if you, or what would you choose your own words to describe the? Well, as I, as, as I as I did tell you, it was hard with Elizabeth. Mm -hmm. uh, when, the next day after Jimmy mm -hmm. uh, died, he was hard a couple of times with um, uh, Jimmy. I didn't hear too much of it because he took he took him away. But by his attitude and his stoniness uh, with Jimmy and, and the way Jimmy was reacting, I knew something had happened where he, the two of them, had added a bit. I know they did. I could see them 500 yards away, going like this, to, you know, for a long time. But we never heard, never heard it. That was never, never t discussed in front of anybody else. And what about the mood on the set? Is there, does that conjure up anything, or is it like all sets? Um, there was a, yes, a definite uh, feeling when you walked on the sound stage in particular, not so much location, mm -hmm. but George was there to work. We all were there to work. So the set was quiet. 
so that people could concentrate, people could think. Usually when you walk on the set and the guys are removing the equipment, so they're talking and carrying on, um, it was all done in a very quiet manner, um, minimum of dialogue or discussion. Yes, put the light there and the scrim there and so forth and so on, but not general hubbub that you usually hear. And I remember <clears throat> the uh, one set was on a big sound stage, and all the dressing rooms were way at one end. And those of us who were not in the scene were in our various dressing rooms or any other dressing rooms and talking and carrying on. And they had hollered quiet. The assistant director came around and said, quiet, folks, we're going to roll the camera. Well, we were quiet, but we were quite a ways away from the set. So we'd be talking. And I happened to look out the window, and they had rolled a scene. And there's George walking by to make sure that we all shut up. And boy, did we clam up, all of us. And he went back to the set. Now we were quiet. And, uh, yeah, I remember I've never had a loud assistant director to yell quiet, because he always felt that you get an actor just in the right mood for a scene, and then some guy says, quiet. But well, he I don't remember that so much, but I do remember the music. Mm -hmm. He had a little thing, a little box by the side of his chair, and a man over there playing uh, two types of, of, of mood music. And depending upon the scene, he would turn up that volume. He'd roll the camera. They'd say, camera rolling. And he'd turn up the volume and just let that music play for a while. Set the mood, turn the volume down, and say action. And we just do it. Mm -hmm. One take, print. 